the, the stories that I'm going to tell you tonight, I've been thinking about, well, like the ones last week, for that matter, for a very long period of time, but I think these even longer. And one of the things that I just do not understand, I cannot fathom this, I, I cannot understand how there can be so much information in such tiny little stories, especially the story of Cain and Abel. That story just, every time I read it, it just flattens me because it, it's only like a paragraph long. There's just nothing to it, you know? And I think about it, 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 and every time I think about it, another layer comes out from underneath it, and then another layer comes out from underneath it. And I can't figure that out. Like, you know, the rational approach that I've been describing to you is predicated on the idea that these stories have somehow encapsulated wisdom that we generated interpersonally and behaviorally, and then an image over very vast stretches of time, and then condensed it into very, very dense, articulated words that are then further refined by the act of being re remembered and transmitted and remembered and transmitted and remembered and transmitted over vast stretches of time. And that's a pretty good argument. I'm willing to, I'm willing to go with it, but it still never f ceases to amaze me how much information such tiny little passages can, can contain. So, we'll, we'll take that apart today. And I think it's especially true with the story of Cain and Abel, because it, it works on the individual level, and it works on the familial level, and it works on the political level, and it works at the level of warfare, and it works at the level of economics, and it's, that's a lot for a little tiny one paragraph story to cover, man. Now, you know, you could object, well, with these stories, you never know what you're reading into it and what's in the story, right? That's part of, let's call it the postmodern dilemma, and, and fair enough. And there's really no answer to that, any more than there is an answer to how do you know your interpretation of the world is, well, let's not say correct, but sufficient. There's some answer to that. It's, it's sufficient in if you can act it out in the world and other people don't object too much and you don't die and nature doesn't take a bite out of you any more often than necessary. You know, those are the constraints within which we live. So it, you have some way of determining whether your interpretation is at least functionally successful and that's, and that's not trivial. And I guess you can say the same thing to the interpretations that might be laid out on these stories. And at the moment, that's probably good enough. Hopefully, you find the interpretations functionally significant at multiple levels. And I also think the chance of managing that by chance is very, very small. You know, to, to be able to pull off an interpretation of a story that works at multiple levels simultaneously, you think with each level that it applies, the chances that you've stumbled across something by chance have to be decreasing, right? Now, th there's a technical term for that in psychology. It's called something like multi-method, multi-trait uh, method of determining whether or not something is accurate. And the idea is the, m the more ways that you can measure it and get the same result, the more confident you can be that you're not just deluding yourself with your a priori hypotheses, you know, that, that, that there's actually something out there. So I guess that's another part of this method is that, and it's also a method that I use in my, in my speaking, I think. I, I don't try to tell people anything that isn't personally relevant, you know, because you should know why you are being taught something, right? You, you should know what the fact is good for, and then it should be good for you personally, at least in some sense, and then if you act it out in the world, it should be good for your family and maybe for, should have some significance for the broader community. I mean, I think that's what meaning means, and I don't really see the utility in being taught things that, aren't meaningful, facts that aren't meaningful, because there's an infinite number of facts and there's no way you're going to remember all of them. They have to be, they have to have the aspect of tools, essentially, something like that, because we are tool-using creatures. Well, these, these stories have that aspect. There's, as far as I can tell, there's nothing, there's no doubt about that. So here's the stories in Genesis 2, very famous stories, obviously. Virtually everybody who's even vaguely versed in Western, roughly speaking, Western, um, Western culture knows these stories. And that's something that's interesting, too, that stories can be so foundational that everybody shares them. I mean, you can say the same thing about a fairly large handful of fairy tales as well, or you could at least until recently. But the fact that stories are foundational, I think, also means that they have to be given a kind of well, even if you don't give them any respect, 
you have to at least treat them as remarkable curiosities. So why those stories, and, and why did they stick around, and why does everybody know them? And it's not self-evident by any stretch of the imagination, and you can use explanations. You can use the Freudian explanation. Freud sort of thought that the Judeo-Christian was predicated on the idea that the figure of the father, the familial father, was expanded up into cosmic dimensions so that mankind existed in the same relationship to the cosmic father, let's say, that an infant or a small child existed in relationship to his or her, her own father. And that's a reasonable critique, I would say, to some degree, but it does, and, and, and this was purposeful, it does imply, more than imply in Freud's case, that people who adopt a religious belief that has a personified figure as, at its apex are essentially acting out the role of dependent children, and, you know, I thought about that critique for a long time, and believe me, that's been a powerful critique. One of the best books I ever read, called The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker, I think took that line of argumentation. It, it, it developed it as well as any, any book I've ever seen argue it. Becker tried to bring closure to Freudian psychoanalysis on religion, and he did a pretty wicked job of it. Like, I think the book is seriously flawed and wrong. But it's really a great book. Like some books are, well, some books are wrong in really good ways, right? They make a powerful, powerful argument. They really take it to its extreme. I think Becker missed the point, and he missed it in the same way that Freud missed Jung's point, and Becker, who wrote this book on the psychology, the psychoanalysis of religion, never referred to Jung except very briefly in the introduction, and I think that was a major mistake. But Becker took the argument that the hypothesis of God is nothing but an attempt by human beings to recreate a quasi-infantile state of dependency and to be able to rely on an all-knowing father and to thereby recover the comfort, perhaps, that we experienced when we were young and had a hypothetically all-knowing father for those of us who were lucky to have someone who vaguely resembled